How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here and welcome back to the channel. So today I'm finally handling Alola. That's right, the last region that I've never done a Professor Oak's challenge in. It's been, <laughs> quite frankly, far too long. And I figured I'd get this game under my belt before going into Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl in just a few months. So let's get right into the rules. Firstly, I have to capture and evolve every Pokemon available before each trial. These will act as replacements for gym badges in the game, since these are the only games in the entire series that do the whole trial thing, with uh, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon included. Second, no trading, and third, no glitches. Simple, right? Well, find out as I complete Professor Oak's challenge in Pokemon Sun and Moon. Make sure to click like, subscribe since we're super close to 100,000 subscribers, and I'll be streaming directly after this the shiny only Let's Go Pikachu and EV Professor Oaks challenge on Twitch over at twitch.tv slash chaotic meatball TV, link in the description. Anyway, let's get into it. So while we go through the initial bits of the game, let me explain a few things different about Gen 7. Firstly, these games go based on the same EXP scaling system that Generation 5 does, which if you remember my black and white and black to white to oak challenges, that was one of the longest ones I've done in the case of the latter. So, this one's definitely going to be pretty damn long. However, there's a few things I can do to speed this up. Firstly, I can use Pokemon Refresh, this generation's replacement for Pokemon Ami, where I can get all of my Pokemon up to two hearts of affection and get a 20% EXP boost because of it. Secondly, Pokemon with a three-stage evolution system also get a 20% boost if I keep them unevolved. So, for example, with my starter, if I let it evolve at level 17, it won't get that 20% EXP boost. But if I stop the evolution and keep doing that every level until level 33, I'd get another 20% boost on top of the refresh. Thirdly, I'll be able to get a decent number of rare candies in this game, both from feeding my Pokemon Poke Beans and getting them from the cafe owners and the Pokemon centers, but also because Alolan Meowth has the pickup ability, and having a few of them at level 21 in the party will give them a 10% chance each of picking up an item after a battle, which then consists of another 3% chance of getting a rare candy. This means 0.3% times 5, I'll have a 1.5% chance of getting a rare candy after every battle, so I should be in a pretty good position throughout, which will be important as I go into the first section even. Anyway, enough babbling, let's get into some actual Pokemon. After falling off a bridge, I get to pick my starter. Well, that was a bit of a tone shift. Now, this decision really doesn't make much of a difference, as they all evolve into their final forms at level 34, but for one difference. Litten and Poplio don't get four attacking moves for grinding until level 15, whereas Rowlet gets four of them by level 11, giving it a bit of time save since I don't have to run back to the Pokemon Center over and over again, instead having more power points. So we choose the Grassy Bird and move on to Route 1. The game is also set to daytime before the festival in Icky Town, so I make sure to grab Picky Peck, Young Goose, Lediba, Caterpie, and Grubbin to fill up my party before moving into Icky Town taking on another rival battle before we're able to make the game nighttime, stopping by Kukui's lab to officially start the challenge with the Rotom decks, and now that I'm not being handheld, I can grab Slowpoke and Wingle here in the Howley outskirts, and Spinarak and Alolan Rattata during the night on Route 1. With those in hand, I'm able to head on towards Howoli City and head into the Trainer School, where I can handle a few trainers and get the EXP share for my troubles. I'd like to say that this is probably the all-powerful device for this challenge over the Pokedex, but it probably wouldn't be as catchy if I called it the EXP chair challenge now, would it? There's also a few Pokemon here that I need to grab, including both Grimer and Magnemite, but the most important thing here is Alolan Meowth, which, of course, I said before has Pickup and, unfortunately for me, Technician, because this is irritating, because that means I'm catching a bunch of Technician ones before I'm able to get all five of my Pickup ones. But after a few saves and resets between the Technician ones, I'm able to get five Pickup Meowths, throw them all into the party, and move onward into the city itself. There isn't much to grab here, though there is the ever-irritating Abra, seeing as teleport is always a bit of a pain, but I managed to get it within two encounters thanks to the Ultra Balls that are available here in the city. Also, inside the Pokemon Center is my first chance of getting some rare candies from my usage of Poke Beans. It's pretty easy to blow through the initial bunch that I'm given at the beginning of the game, so it'll be important to visit this place and stagger my grinding so that each and every one of my Pokemon can be given that 20% EXP boost. 
Next up is Route 2, which is a few new Pokemon in Smeargle and Drowsy in the grass patch closest to Howoli, but this game introduces a new mechanic where you can encounter different Pokemon based on what patch of grass you're in. I think they did something similar with Dark Grass in Gen 5, but that was Double Grass, so I digress. Near the Pokemon Center, I can grab Growlithe, Cutie Fly, and two Spearow, using the second of the latter to trade from a chop inside of said Pokemon Center. Now, here's where that other encounter in Howoli City comes in, though. This Pokemon Center sells Luxury Balls, and after going back there, I'm able to grab myself a Pichu. I didn't wait to grab Meowth with these, because they're going to evolve by the end of the section anyway. Trust me, it kinda helps to make them a pickup squad. Anyway, I'm gonna want to evolve Pichu before level 12 to make the next section a bit easier. Returning to Route 2, the last two Pokemon I can grab here are Makihita, a 30% encounter from a rustling spot, and while there is an encounter from the pile of berries next to the Pokemon Center, there's nothing here at this time, so I'll have to grab it later. Next up on the docket is the Howley Cemetery, where I can grab Drifloon, Ghastly, and Zubat during the day, as well as Mistrevis at night. Oh yeah, and there's another encounter here in Litwick, exclusively on Saturdays. From what, you may ask? Island Scan. Yeah, I'm doing it. Now, I hear people don't do this because they don't technically have Pokedex entries, but I'm gonna say it now, if you want to do an actual Professor Oak's challenge, you capture and evolve every obtainable Pokemon before every gym badge, or in this case, trial. Rant aside, I can do the same with Chikorita on Route 2 and Clink in Howley City. Yeah, we're gonna have to get that one to level 49 before the end of the first section. Thankfully, with all that handled, though, that's all of the encounters for this section but that's a boatload to grind. The highest EXP yield I can get in this section is Smeargle on Route 2, which appears 20% of the time, so that's a relatively decent chance. There's also 20% from Drowsy and Abra, which also yield quite a bit as well, so starting out with grinding up my Meowth here was a pretty good idea. The other slot on my party was used up by Rowlet, since I wanted to make my level barrier 25. Using rare candies on anything above that seems like it'll be the smartest play. Though if I end up with a smaller amount of rare candies than what's needed, I'll be checking what EXP group all of my Pokemon are in and moving them up to level 30 in the most efficient way possible. There are a few Pokemon that can't exactly grind themselves up though, those being Abra and Machop after a certain point due to being a trade Pokemon. But that's easily bypassed by basically all of my Meowths being able to KO things on the route. So of course, starting with my Pokemon that evolved before level 25, Evolutions include Ghastly into Haunter at level 25, Rattata into Raticate at level 20 during the night, Caterpie into Metapod at level 9 and into Butterfree one level later, Lediba into Ledian at level 18, Spinarak into Ariados at level 22, Grubbin into Chargebug at level 20, Wingull into Pelipper at level 25, Abra into Kadabra at level 16, Makihita into Hariyama at level 24, Zubat into Golbat at level 22, and into Crobat one level later, Spearow into Fearow at level 20, Young Goose into Gumshoes at level 20 during the day, and Cutie Fly into Rabombi at level 25. Here, I'm sitting at a pretty good 47 rare candies currently, but we've still got Picky Peck, Slowpoke, Magnemite, Grimer, Drowsy, Drifloon, Machop, Clink, Chikorita, and Litwick to get to level 25 by themselves. So, after training all of those guys up and nothing evolving, it puts me up at a solid 87 rare candies. This puts me 9 levels away from evolving everything with the rare candies, so I decided to swap one of my Meowths out for Pichu, as well as fitting in Drowsy into the party so that I could evolve it into Hypno one level later at level 26, then do the same with Drifloon. The reason we do this over Machop and Picky Peck is because, well, the former is irritating thanks to trade disobedience, but the latter is part of the medium fast EXP group, which needs 21,952 EXP to get to level 28, whereas Drifloon is part of the fluctuating EXP group, which only needs 18,440, quite a bit less. Now, you may be thinking, well, doesn't Picky Peck get the extra 20% EXP boost from being a three stage unevolved Pokemon? And while it does, it's not enough to offset about 3,500 points, making Drifloon the better choice. Pichu evolves into Pikachu at level 12, as well as one of my Meowths into Persian through Hack's Happiness, while training Drifloon, which evolves into Drifblim at level 28. Luckily enough, I got the five extra rare candies I needed while finishing up these Pokemon to evolve the remainder of the encounters, getting Rowlet into Dartrix at level 26, and into Decidueye at level 34, 
Pikipek into Trumbeak at level 26 and into two cannon two levels later, Slowpoke into Slowbro at level 37, Magnemite into Magneton at level 30, Grimer into Muck at level 38, Machomp into Machoke at level 28, Clink into Clang at level 38 and into Kling Clang at level 49, Chikorita into Bayleaf at level 26 and into Meganium at level 32, and finally Litwick into Lampent at level 41. I can't quite get Chandelure yet due to the lack of Dusk Stones, but we'll get that later. Finishing the section with a total of... Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Before going into the trial, I made sure to capture Crub Brawler from the berry pile next to the Pokemon Center. Now, this gives me a total of 62 Pokemon and a time of 48 hours and 26 minutes. Not too bad, and only a few hours more than the times on our Professor Oak Challenge Discord server. We have a leaderboard there, and the link is in the description to the invite if you want to try these challenges yourself and shoot for low times. That was a relatively easy trial, taking out the Totem Gumshoes and letting me move on to Route 3, but before that, I can actually capture the Diglett inside of Verdant Cavern now that I'm done with the trial. Now that we're in Route 3 proper though, I can get Rufflet from a Flying Ambush Encounter, or Vullaby if you're playing Moon version, Menke, and Delibird from the Grass, as well as Cyndaquil from Island Scanned on Sundays. Oh, you're saying that I'm missing a Pokemon? No, I'm not! Believe me, there's definitely no Bagon on this crowd. Totally not a level 50 evolution along with a level 54 evolution on the same route. Definitely doesn't exist. Moving onward, the penultimate area for this section is the Melee Melee Meadows, where I can capture both Oricorio and Cottony, or Petalil if you're playing Moon version, immediately evolving the latter into Whimsicott thanks to the Sunstone that I had already gotten from Pickup. Sweet that we already had that, but that was pretty obvious. After all, we have already have a full team's worth of leftovers. Anyway, we do have to take care of Bagon because it does exist. Now, I could SOS chain for Salamence, but SOS chaining for a 1% Salamence spawn on a 1% Bagon sounds like a plan for punishment. And while it could potentially save a ton of time, it could also drain a boatload of time as well. Yes, I sat here with my Meowths and my Rufflet in my party, saving and then searching for Bagon. If I didn't get it on my first Bagon encounter, I'd reset, try to find it again, and repeat the process. This only took two encounters with Bagon, as the first I didn't get a single SOS encounter, instead accidentally knocking it out, so I swapped two of my Meowths out for my Haunter and Ariados, both of which have Nightshade so that I could lower the HP of Bagon and get it to call for help more often, but make sure that I have a 100% chance of not KOing it since I still don't have access to False Swipe. On the second encounter of Bagon, the first SOS call resulted in Salamence, saving me boatloads of time and allowing me to capture it in two Ultra Balls, which is absolutely insane. This was definitely worth the effort to find, and seeing as my rare candies are now going to be reserved for Rufflet, it's probably going to take, yeah, a lot less time. The last area I can access is the Seaward Cave, and while there aren't any new regular encounters here, Island Scan rears its head once again, yielding Totodile on Mondays. However, that's not it for encounters since we've got to revisit Howley City. We've got a SOS chain on Pichu until I find Hepini, which has a 50% chance of holding an Oval Stone. The only way I can get the item to evolve it in this section is by finding a Hapini that's holding an Oval Stone, so I decided to pull Butterfree out of the PC to boost that chance to 60%. Fortunately, the first one that I caught did have the item. Now for the grinding, and boy howdy, this section's actually kinda neat. So the reason that we wanted to evolve Pikachu into Pikachu at level 12 is for this section, so that we can repel trick out level 12 Oricorios in the Melee Melee Meadows, by far our highest EXP yield in the section. Of course, we want this thing fainted so that it doesn't gain any levels from said Oricorios, but letting me keep it out front will still let me repel trick. Starting out, I immediately evolved Hapini into Chansey while holding the Oval Stone during the daytime, so I could let it sit in the party and gain friendship, replacing a Meowth for the time being as I did the grinding for Diglett, getting it up to level 26 and evolving into Duck Trio. Now I'm making the barrier for this section level 30, so we should have enough rare candies for Rufflet by the end, but I'm probably huffing a little bit of copium on that one. Next up is Mankey, who evolves into Primeape at level 28, and then allowing me to move on to Totodile. This is where Chansey finally evolves into Blissey with max happiness, letting me add back my fourth Meowth and evolve Totodile into Croconaut level 29, and into Feraligator one level later. Three more left, and I figured I'd go for Bagon first since it evolves exactly at level 30, 
Taking a bit, and since sadly this is one of the few dragon types that doesn't get Dragon Rage, I'm able to beat up Oracorios enough though to get to level 30, evolving into Shellgon and thankfully not having to continue further. Second to last on the list is Cyndaquil, whose final evolution is all the way at level 36, so I just bring it up to level 30 and check my rare candies. 17, that's not too bad, but still 7 away from fully evolving Rufflet from level 30, so I brought in Rufflet itself, grinding it up to level 31 and getting up to 22 rare candies. Alright, well I figured that bringing back Cyndaquil for a few levels would be my best choice, getting it to level 33 on both the refresh and unevolved EXP bonuses, and getting up to 27 rare candies, using them to evolve Cyndaquil into Quilava and into Typhlosion at level 36, and Rufflet into Braviary at level 54, finishing the section with a total of 84 Pokemon in a time of 67 hours and 43 minutes. Not bad at all, if I do say so myself. Less than 20 hours in this section? Makes sense since there weren't that many Pokemon for this section, and I didn't really have to go much higher than level 30. With Hollow defeated, I can finally get off this godforsaken island in order to move on to a slightly less godforsaken island. Oh, right, there's 10 Carrot Hill still. But first, there's a patch of grass here on Route 1 that's blocked by a few rocks, and now that I've got the Ride Tauros, I'm able to break through them and grab both Bonsly, immediately evolving into Sudowoodo at level 15 while knowing Mimic, and Munchlax, slapping the latter into my party and moving into 10 Carat Hill, where in the cave I can capture Carbink and Rog and Rolla from regular encounters, Sableye from an SOS encounter with Carbink, and finally, Dano from Island Scan. Told you this island was godforsaken. I don't even get the 20% unevolved boost until level 50, and by that point, I'm probably going to be evolving it with rare candies. But hey, I guess that's what happens when you do island scan. The farthest hollow of 10 Carat Hill has our last set of encounters for this general area, containing Spinda and Rockruff, finally letting me move onto Akala Island. There's not much in the way before I can access Route 4, which has the likes of two Lillipup, Igglybuff during the day, Mudbray, Eevee, which I need three of for the time being, but I caught all late that I would need, and Venipede from Island Scan on Thursday. Fortunately, I've already got a Moonstone for when Igglybuff evolves, thanks to those handy Luxury Balls from Route 2, so it won't be too hard. Oh, wait, I uh, forgot about the Luxury Balls. Whoops. After ramming my face into Howl's Pokemon over and over again, I made my way to Paniola Ranch, containing both Tauros and Miltank, which is cool I guess, but Route 5 has some cooler Pokemon in the form of Fomantis from Regular Encounters, and Bellsprout from Island Scan on Fridays. Lastly, there's a Pokemon Center here on Route 5, where I can use one of those Lillipups I caught earlier in order to trade for a Bound Suite. With a bunch of Grass types in hand though, why not offset some of those with some Water types? I can actually enter the trial and obtain the Lapras Ride Pager, but because I don't have to complete it, I can head out back into Melee Melee Island, grabbing two more Pokemon on Route 1 and Tentacool Infineon. That's not it though, since Melee Melee Sea to the west of Howley City contains some trainers, and back in Seaward Cave I can surf for Psyduck. Lastly, at the end of Seaward Cave I can access Kalae Bay, which I can grab Horsey from on Wednesdays thanks to Island Scan. No Kingdra, since no trades of course, but that's fine, there's plenty enough Pokemon in this challenge as it is. Last area is all the way back on Akala Island inside of the Brooklyn Hill, the actual trial site, containing stuff like Poliwag, Dewpiter and Paris during the day, Morlul and Surskit during the night, Wishiwashi from one of the trial specific encounters, and finally a female Meryl from Island Scan on Saturdays. Of course, you guys know that we'll have to breed this later on when we get its incense, so getting a female is paramount. With our island scan friend in hand though, that's actually the last encounter for this section. So the question, as always, is where to grind? Well, we could stay here in Brooklet Hill where all of the Pokemon are the highest level available for this section, but unfortunately for me, that's not going to be enough EXP. The base yields of things like Paris, Dewpiter, and Poliwag are just not good enough to hedge against Paniola Ranch's Tauros and Miltank, but both of those are 5% encounters, and if I really want to maximize the EXP I get from there, I have to SOS chain, which then means that pickup doesn't trigger until the end of the battle, so that's definitely not happening when I have to deal with a level 64 evolution. However, the other two Pokemon on the route, Lillipup and Mudbray, are perfectly fine to grind on as well, since they also have a higher EXP yield than those in Brooklet Hill. 
I also have to contend with four friendship evolutions, all of which I forgot to use luxury balls on because I'm an idiot, and I don't feel like going back and looking for them again. So instead, I basically paired them up with another Pokemon to train with, the first pair being Dano and Munchlax, where I trained Dano to level 30 for my initial level barrier for this section, evolving Munchlax into Snorlax with max happiness during that grind. Next pair was more of a trio, as I used both Rock and Rolla and Rock Ruff along with Iglybuff in my party, evolving Rock and Rolla into Bulldore at level 25, and during the grind for Rock Ruff, Iglybuff evolved into Jigglypuff with max happiness, and into Wigglytuff with a Moonstone, all before Rock Ruff evolved into Lycanroc at level 25. This balance, oddly enough, is working extremely well, and sure enough, pairing my first Eevee with Lillipup yielded similar results getting Lillipup to level 30 around the same time that Eevee evolved into Umbreon with max happiness during the night. Last one to take care of is another Eevee, which I paired with Mudbray as it was the last of my relatively bulky mons that could handle itself at the same level as the wild Pokemon in Paniola Ranch, and fortunately for me, it evolves exactly at level 30, allowing me to evolve Eevee into Espeon during the day with max happiness, shortly before Mudbray evolves into Mudstale at level 30. While I'm also on the Eevee train as well, I figured I'd take care of the Pokemon Refresh stuff with my third, getting it up to two hearts of affection and leveling it up once while knowing a Fairy-type move in order to get Sylveon. With those easy evolutions taken care of, it's time for the rest of the grinding. I figured that I could use my level 30 Lillipup like I did in the Gen 5 games, leaving it up front with Vital Spirit and swarming myself with level 15 Pokemon as those are the highest in the route, since again, both Tauros and Miltank have a base 172 EXP yield, whereas the Pokemon in Brooklet Hill range from anywhere between 54 and 64, so it makes made too much sense to grind here. With this grind, I managed to get Bound Sweet into Steeny at level 28, and into Sarina one level later while knowing Stomp, Paris into Parasect at level 24, Morlul into Shenotic at level 24, Poliwag into Poliwhirl at level 25, Dupider into Araquanid at level 22, Surskit into Masquerain at level 22, Tentacool into Tentacruel at level 30, Venipede into Whirlipede at level 29, and into Skullipede one level later, Bellsprout into Weeping Bell at level 21, and Meryl into Azumarill at level 18. I also made sure to train Fomantis, Psyduck, Finneon, and Horsey up to level 32 during this time, making me sit at 28 rare candies. I still need 34 for Dano to fully evolve, so I went in order of Finneon into Luminion at level 31, Horsey into Seedra at level 32, Lillipup into Herdier at level 31 and into Stoutland one level later, Psyduck into Golduck at level 33, and Fomantis into Lurantis at level 34 during the day. This was just enough grinding to get me up to 34 rare candies, perfect number, so I used all of them on Dano to evolve it into Zwilus at level 50 and into Hydreigon at level 64, finishing the section with a total of 143 Pokemon and a time of 98 hours and 38 minutes. Dang, just over 30 hours. This time with a bunch of Pokemon, very happy with the frequency of rare candy pickups, and the further I get, the less they're needed, though. We still need quite a few for the next few sections. The pre-Kiawe section isn't actually too bad, since there's only 32 Pokemon for this section, though we've got a few high-level evolutions to take care of. Upon completion of Lana's Trial, I managed to get a hold of the Fishing Rod, so there's a few places we gotta visit. First of which is right here in Brooklet Hill, where I can grab Magikarp, Goldeen, Phoebus, and Alomomola. Would've loved to have access to the latter in this section because of how good EXP it yields, but hey, we can't always get what we want. Moving back over to Kalei Bay, I was able to grab something from the rippling fishing spots, but hilariously enough, I accidentally SOS'd a Gyarados out. So I caught it before finding Shelter, and then in Melee Melee Sea, I was able to fish for Corsola and Love Disc, then grab a Marini from an SOS calling from Corsola. Fortunately, this is the last section where we don't have access to Adrenaline Orbs, as they unlock after three regular trials, so we'll only have a few more hard SOS encounters to grab. Moving up all the way back to Paniola Town, there's one more fishing encounter in Barboach, finishing up backtracking for now. This basically finishes up everything we can do over on Melee Melee Island, by the way, for the rest of the game. So back on Akala, I'm finally able to proceed onto Route 6, which has no new regular Pokemon, but on Sundays with Island Scan, I can pick up Gothita, which is my first instance of a critical capture so far in this game. Pretty neat. That's one Pokemon that evolves over level 40, but there's another one after fighting the Battle Royale, and that's on Route 7, where I'm able to get Sfeel on Mondays from Island Scan while surfing. 
Luckily, that's it for high-level evolutions, but not it for encounters, as Pukumuku is available from surfing, and Star use a 20% fishing encounter from a bubbling spot here on Route 7. Unfortunately though, I'm gonna have to SOS encounter again, as I don't yet have access to a water stone. So after a bit of chaining, I'm finally able to get myself a Starmie and capture it. Not too bad if I say so myself, but we've got one more area to go in the Whale of Volcano Park. Fortunately, everything here is in the first few patches of grass, those being Fletchling, Female Salandit, Cubone, Kangaskhan, and Magby. There's one SOS encounter though, being Magmar from the Magby encounter, making it so that I don't have to raise one of these Pokemon up to level 30. With that, that's all the encounters for Pre-Kyawe, and there's three potential spots for me to grind. The first potential area is akin to my Gym Whiteout strategy, as I can enter Kiawe's Trial and fight as a low and Marowak over and over again, as long as I choose the wrong option over and over again. This is level 18, along with a base AXP yield of 149, and since you can get the same Pokémon every time, it's very consistent. However, this means that pickup cannot trigger, and I have to white out to the trial in order to leave it, so despite the base EXP yield being very high, it's not really worth the time waste. Second, where the Volcano Park has a very low EXP yield of all the encounters with the exception of Kangaskhan, but that's a 1% regular encounter, so there's no reason for me to be here. The choice I made was to grind on Route 6, as it's the home of Oracorio here on Akala, with a base EXP yield of 167, even higher than Marowak. This appears 20% of the time, so it's less consistent, but definitely not too bad. I figured I'd make my level barrier 35 for this section, since then I'd only need 6 candies for Gothitel, 3 for Toxapex, and 9 for Walrein, and a total of 18 really shouldn't be hard to get, especially since I've already got 4 of them from this section's trainers and wild counters in load. The lower levels were easy to take care of with everyone thanks to the high-level pickup Meowths, and the rest was easy enough, evolving Goldeen into Sea King at level 33, Barboach into Whizcash at level 30, Cubone into Marowak at level 28 during the night, Fletchling into Fletchender at level 34, and into Talonflame one level later, and Salandit into Salazzle at level 33. This just leaves Marini, Gothita, and Sfeel, and of course after raising them up to level 35, I had more than enough rare candies, evolving Marini into Toxapex at level 38, Gothita into Gotharita at level 36 and into Gothitelle at level 41, and Sfeel into Celio at level 36 and into Walrein at level 44. I actually had three leftover rare candies by the end of this as well, which I'm sure will come in handy for something, after all we're not even off of the second island. With that said, I finished the section with a total of 175 Pokemon, and a time of 134 hours and 15 minutes. Dang, those uh, Marowak certainly would have helped keep this section shorter than it was, since we're nearly 135 hours in and not off the second island, so let's get a move on. Well, that's what I would say, if this wasn't a thing I had to deal with. Yeah, it's time for Poke Pelago. This is what we call actual hell. This mode forces you to go on to 12 hour expeditions for the smallest chances of evolution stones, which if you remember, we need a boatload of, but thankfully, because Game Freak doesn't know how to program a video game, there's an exploit with this that'll speed up these expeditions astronomically. Firstly though, before I'm able to do any of the exploit, I need to get Isle of Fun to level 2, which takes 45 Pokemon and 90 normal Pokebeans to start the expeditions for stones immediately. Then with the exploit, all you have to do is set up everything that you want in-game, which in this case is the path for Brilliant Stone Hunting Mission, exit Poke Pelago, save the game, fully exit the game, and set the console, or in this case the computer's time if you're using an emulator, to January 31st of any year of your choosing, and set the time to 2359, or 58 if you're slow to get back in-game, and get back in before the time transitions forward. Then bam, everything is completed, and we're in business. With this, I'm able to get two Thunderstones, letting me evolve Pikachu into Raichu, Eevee into Jolteon, and with three Waterstones, I can evolve Shelter into Cloyster, Poliwhirl into Poliwrath, and Eevee into Vaporeon, two Firestones to evolve Growlithe into Arcanine, and Eevee into Flareon, three Dusk Stones to evolve Mistrevis into Mismagius, Lampent into Chandelure, and one for later, and two Leaf Stones to evolve Weepin' Bell into Victory Bell, and one for later, as well as one Dawn Stone, Shiny Stone, and Ice Stone from some later sections. So what's that extra Dusk Stone for? Well, I hate you ask because it also involves Poke Pelago. 
See, Murkrow is available through Poke Pelago itself, and getting it to show up is a 4.35% chance. Very low, but it's also a lower chance to keep the Pokémon instead of it running away. Thankfully, there is a good guide that also entails shiny hunting in Poke Pelago by the user Shiny Collector. Link to the video in the description, and as I'm showing on screen right now, it basically shows you how to get the Pokémon to stay, and he does a really good description of it, and I, I don't think I could really sum it up very well here. By the end of it though, I got Murkrow to stay on the fourth attempt, immediately evolving it into Haunchcrow and stuffing it into the box, because dear lord, I'm never looking at it again! Sadly, we'll have more encounters to get here in the Poke Pelago, as well as in an entirely new game in Ultra Sun and Moon when I get around to it, but I digress. Fortunately for me though, the rest of this section is extremely small, as the only new area with new Pokémon is in Route 8, where I can capture Stuffle, Chinchu, Wimpod, and a female Luxio on Tuesdays from Island Scan. That only leaves four Pokémon to evolve, all of which were level 20 around there, so each of these Pokémon are only going to take around 10 levels or less to evolve. However, there's one of them that only takes one level, and that's in the Lush Jungle, where I'm able to take one of my Eevees, put it next to the Moss Rock, and level it up once to evolve it into Leafeon. Before I do the grinding, though, I headed all the way back to Paniola Ranch so that I could breed my Luxio, hatching Shinx before heading back to Route 6 for my grinding spot. The Oricorios here are still perfect for grinding, as Jinchu and Luxio have a very easy time KOing everything, though Stuffle and Wimpod have a bit more difficulty. The former because the Oricorios on Akala are Psychic Flying type, and the latter having the ability Wimp Out, which basically makes it automatically run away if it goes below half HP. So I actually swapped them out for two Pickup Meowths, throwing all four of these Pokémon into the party and grinding them up with the EXP share. Also, getting the 20% EXP boost on my Pokémon no longer takes a few minutes each, rather I can give them a single Rainbow Beam, and giving them immediately two Hearts of Affection saves quite a bit of time in overall, so the process of grinding throughout the rest of the game should be a lot faster. In all, I evolved Chinchu into Lantern at level 27, Luxio into Luxray at level 30, then Stuffle into Beware at level 27, and Wimpod into Galissapod at level 30. Perfect! Now this section's finished with a total of 197 Pokémon, and a time of 143 hours and 10 minutes. I'm able to fight the Totem Lurantis, finishing Malo's trial and the last regular trial of Akala. All in around 8 hours, not too bad. With all of the regular trials on Akala finished, all we've got left is the grand trial against Olivia, but we've got a pretty significant chunk of new Pokémon in this section. Sticking around here in the lush jungle, I'm able to catch Pokémon here and now, so in the northern area I'm able to grab myself a Basimian, Pinsir, and Comfey from regular encounters, but oh boy, it's time for some of the stupidest encounters in the game, Weather Exclusive SOS Pokémon. Now, normally it rains here between the hours of 5 and 6 p.m., so that's a very small window. But fortunately, I can get Rain Dance from the Royal Avenue's Battle Royal Pokémon Center, so that's alleviated. But that only takes care of Gumi, a 10% encounter from SOS during the rain, since that decreases Cast Form's encounter rate to 1%. But also fortunately for me, I can grab the TMs for both Hail and Sandstorm, effectively giving me around 50 turns along with adrenaline orbs to ensure the capture of cast form is as quick and painless as possible. We'll have to come back to fully evolve Gumi since it only evolves into its final form in the rain, but for now I can finally head into Kani Kani City where some fossils are purchasable. Thank god the game didn't make me hunt for these in the Poke Pelago or I would be blowing my brains out. And here in Sun version, I'm able to revive both Kratidos and Tertuga on Route 8, whereas you'd be getting shield on at Archon in Moon version. Seriously, I hate Poke Pelago. Why is this a thing? Please kill me! Shockingly enough, though, there's not much left for the section. Seeing as Memorial Hill only holds a single Pokémon in Phantom, while the Akala outskirts has Nose Pass normally, as well as On Edge on Wednesdays through Island Scan. Also, gotta say, On Edge is a stupidly amazing powerhouse. Using it in my Steel type Hardcore Nuzlocke and Sword and Shield a while back was amazing, and you should totally check out this video if you haven't already. Link is in the i card on the top right hand corner of your screen, as well as in the description. Shameless shilling aside, there's only one thing for me to do before grinding, and that's buying the sea incense here in Kani Kani City, and bringing it all the way back to Paniola Ranch to breed my Azumarill with a male of its egg group, hatching Azumarill in no time flat. Alright, well thankfully we've only got four Pokémon to level up for this section, and all of them can handle themselves pretty easily. 
However, with Gumi fully evolving at level 50, I figured putting all of the Pokemon into the party was out of the question since my Meowths need to do their jobs. So the only place I really figured I should grind is the Akala outskirts, but only during the day. See, there's the smallest optimization here that's important, as Alolan Raticate has a base EXP yield of 145 during the night, whereas Gumshoes has a base yield of 146. Yeah, that one point might not be much, but during the few hours of grinding, it certainly can add up to a few minutes saved, especially when it appears 30% of the time. However, I didn't know whether I should put two Pokemon into the party at the same time, or just use one and have a fainted Pokemon with the Vital Spirit ability up front, but I'd figured I'd go with the former, as keeping Gumi in the party while grinding the other three felt like the fastest way of doing things. The EXP yield might be slightly lower due to level 23's not being as plentiful to fight, but at the same time I'm still getting pickup drops and having two Pokemon getting levels at the same time seems faster. So during the grind, I managed to evolve Kranidos into Rampardos at level 30, Tortuga into Caracosta at level 37, On Edge into Dewblade at level 35, and into Aegislash with a Dusk Stone, as well as training Gumi to level 34 before using the 15 rare candies I had laying around over in the Lush Jungle, evolving Gumi into Slugu at level 40, and into Gudra at level 50 while in the rain. Well, that wasn't too bad, was it? I would say so, since I managed to finish the section with a total of 219 Pokemon and a time of 151 hours and 9 minutes. Two islands down, two to go, but then again there's still one more Pokemon to grab here on Akala before we head over to Ula Ula, and that's Sandygast on Hano Beach. Sweet! Now I'm able to head over to the Mali Garden over on Ula Ula, take care of some story, and catch myself a pile of garbage as well as a larger pile of garbage from an SOS encounter. The fact that I can get some of these evolutions from SOS encounters is pretty useful, and thanks to the boatloads of adrenaline orbs that I have access to now, I can just reserve all of the trainers in each section for the Pokemon that I can't get their evolutions of. Speaking of which, we have another one of those on Route 11 with Panchen, allowing me to get a Pangoro from SOS counters, as well as Kamala, with Vigoroth topping off the area with Island Scan on Fridays. I didn't even bother resetting for a female, so I'm sure you know what that means coming up here soon. Route 10 has a few more Pokemon as well, such as Skarmory from the Shaking Trees and Staravia from Island Scan on Thursdays. Another Pokemon to breed, but we'll finally be able to do that after grabbing Ditto from Mount Hokalani. There's still a few other ones here like Beldum, Minior, Cleffa, and Clefairy from SOS Encounters, capping it off with Axew from Island Scan on Saturdays. Since I still have some of those Moonstones laying around thanks to Pickup, I immediately evolved Clefairy into Clefable with it, leaving just one more encounter. It's time to return to the hell that is Poke Pelago, seeing as now I can search for Trevenant. Instead of Murkrow's 4.3% chance of finding it, Trevenant only has a 2.78% chance of being found. Quite frankly, this took far too long. Probably about three weeks, and then a few days after that to finally get Trevenant to stay, but man, I very, very much hate Poke Pelago. I am not looking forward to Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Thankfully, while waiting though, at least for the first few days, I could spend my time doing my breeding and grinding. Firstly, I headed back to Akala Island and Paniola Ranch so that I could breed both Vigoroth and Staravia with Ditto in order to hatch myself a Slackoff and Starly respectively, leaving just five Pokemon to evolve. Sadly, two of those Pokemon require evolutions in the mid to late 40s, and a third requires early 40s, but that's fine, seeing as the Pokemon on Route 11 are between levels 24 and 27, so I've got plenty of room to grind and get good EXP because of it. I decided to grind during the night here, since while yes, we're losing the one base EXP yield point to the 20% encounter Raticate over Gumshoes like I explained last section, but that's counteracted by the 20% Ariados, whose base EXP yield is 150, over Ladian's 147. Trumbeak's pretty darn good too as another 20% encounter with a base 124 EXP yield, but the king of the area is Kamala at a whopping 168, so making my barrier for rare candies level 40 was plenty enough, allowing me to evolve Vigoroth into Slacking at level 36, and Staravia into Staraptor at level 34. Of course, I also made sure to raise Sandygast, Beldum, and Axew to level 40, but I've only got 11 rare candies. That means I need four more levels to evolve those three. So I just leveled them all up one more time, getting one more candy from Pickup, then evolving Sandygast into Palisand at level 42, Beldum into Matang at level 42, and into Metagross at level 45, and Axew into Fracture at level 42, and into Haxorus at level 48. 
Well, that was quick, but there's still one more Pokemon to grab while I'm waiting for Trevenant, and I know I've described some of the Pokemon in this game as hell to obtain, but oh boy, this one, it just takes the fucking cake. Over in the Mally Garden, I can SOS chain Poliwag during the night for a 1% chance to encounter Politoed. Sadly, this 1% chance only exists while it's raining, but it only rains between the hours of 5 and 6 p.m., which is considered daytime, so what am I supposed to do about that? Well, first of all, I need a good, high-level False Wipe user. Haxorus is probably my best choice for this due to being level 48 and having a type resistance to water. Sadly though, type resistance isn't going to help much due to the fact that Politoed has Perish Song, but we're still in need of encountering the damn thing. So I can go back to Mally City to grab the Damp Rock, a held item that boosts the amount of turns that it's raining. Since Rain Dance only has 5 PP, I'll need a crap ton of ethers as well. Fortunately, I've already stored up quite a number of them from pickup, so that's not a problem. Lastly, I'll need something to help me hold down Politoed. On the off chance that it's the opposite gender of Haxorus, I gave it the TM for Attract, leaving just one more open move slot for an actual attack in order to KO the Poliwags that get in the way, as Haxorus can also learn Rain Dance, making it the all-around perfect Pokemon for this scenario. I figured also teaching all of my Meowth's Rain Dance so that I could swap out for taking more of the Poliwags out would be kinda smart, so as my sixth Pokemon, I also needed something to put things to sleep. The only Pokemon I still have Hypnosis on, though, is Poliwrath, which thankfully can indeed learn Rain Dance, giving me a sixth party member that can keep up that rain and hopefully bait out that Politoed. Thankfully, once I performed all of this strategy, I ended up doing exactly what I needed to do. I had a 90.365% chance of capturing it at 1 HP while asleep, plenty enough to shove Politoed into an Ultra Ball, grabbing Trevenant when it was finally available, and finishing the section with a total of 246 Pokemon and a time of 162 hours and 25 minutes. For such a small amount of Pokemon, this section dragged. Though, coming up with those complicated strategies to grab Politoed was kinda fun. With all that squared away though, I can plow straight through Sophocles' trial and move on from there. There's not too many trials on this island, seeing as we're already to the last regular trial and Acerola. This section does have quite the number of Pokemon to obtain though, so it's not going to be a complete cakewalk. Heading over to Route 12, I'm able to get the Mudstale Ride Pager from Hapu, which lets me cross some rocks. Neat, I guess, but I've had a Mudstale for literal sections now. Would have appreciated the use of this earlier. Anyway, in the grass here on Route 12, I can find myself a Torkoal, Geodude, and Elekid, evolving Geodude into Graveler in one level, as well as Elekid into Electabuzz at level 30 before moving into Blush Mountains. Here I can nab Togedomaru, Turtonator in Sun version, and from Island Scan, Rhyhorn on Sundays. Another over level 40 evolution! Fun! But again, I can't really complain with how late this is. Route 13 has a singular encounter from fishing in bubbling spots, and that's the ugly Bruxish. Seriously, who came up with this abomination? Heading into Tapu Village, there's a trade in the Pokemon Center, where I can trade my Haunter for a Cantonian Graveler, which evolves straight into Golem. Yeah, trade evolution, what a shock. And it's not holding an Everstone. I'm still bitter about that one since I was a kid. Anyway, Tapu Village is also home to a bunch of wild encounters. Since I can get Absol, Vulpix and Sun, or Sandshrew and Moon version, which evolved into Nine Tails with an Ice Stone straight after, two Snow Runt, one of which being female that immediately evolved into Frostlass with a Dawn Stone, Vanillite from an SOS battle with Snow Runt during the hail, and Swine Up on Mondays from Island Scan. Well, that was awfully quick. Well, let's get to the grinding. The best spot for this section was 100% the Tapu Village. Seeing as the evolved Pokemon here as well as the Pokemon Center being literal steps away makes this such a fast progression. I figured that I'd just put all four Pokemon that needed to be leveled up in the same party, with two pickup Meowth still doing their jobs, letting me get up to five rare candies in the process of evolving Swinub into Piloswine at level 33, Rhyhorn into Rhydon at level 42, Snow Run into Glalie at level 42, Vanillite into Vanillish at level 46, and into Vanillux one level later. This lets me finish the section with a total of 268 Pokemon and a time of 167 hours and 6 minutes. We're getting there, one more grand trial to take down, as Ace Rolla and her offbeat shenanigans were stomped out. It's time for the third grand trial, and holy moly, literally everything here evolves at level 40 or above. I guess as a later section it makes sense, but it doesn't get any less annoying. 
After finishing Acerola's trial, I turned my booty straight around back to the thrifty Mega Mart in order to capture a few new Pokemon, the first of which being another 1% SOS trade evolution encounter. Before finding it though, I find yet another shiny in Haunter that I immediately destroy with a Night Slash because I'm not chaining Haunters again. Oh yeah, that reminds me, I didn't mention the shiny Poliwag that I absolutely killed. Yeah, I'm not really a fan of those. Anyway, I made sure to capture Gengar, as well as Klefki and Mimikyu. Heading back to Route 13 now that Acerola's trial is finished, there's a new area in the Hyena Desert that's connected to it that's now open, containing the likes of Sandile, Trapinch, and Gabite from an SOS encounter during the Sandstorm. Fortunately, that's not too hard since there's a Sandstorm running at all hours of the night, so no need to use a Sandstorm user to find it. Moving through a few more areas, Route 16, sure it has Duosion on Tuesdays thanks to Island Scan, but do you know what else it has? Frickin' Zygarde! Thankfully though, we don't have to capture it, seeing as I was able to search for Zygarde cells ever since running into Dexio and Cena back in Heihei City on Akala Island, since they give me the Zygarde cube. There's just over 50 cells available, but not enough cores, so I just stuck with the 10 cells, getting the 10% dog form as my Pokedex entry before moving on to Route 17, the home of Roselia, by Island Scan on Wednesdays, immediately evolving into Roserade with a shiny stone. Since that's the last encounter of the game, I just made sure to stop by Route 16's Pokemon Center, flying back to Akala Island to breed Roselia while holding the Rose Incense with Ditto to produce an egg and hatch myself a Badoo. I also need to breed Duosion and Gabite while I'm here, spitting out a Celosis and Gibble respectively as well. With those three in tow, again, all of the Pokemon that need grinding evolve past level 40 in this section, so making sure to take care of the Team Skull Grunts and their mounds of EXP over in Poe Town while taking care of the story progression at the same time is a pretty good idea. Ripping through the Grunts, evolving Sandile into Crocorock at level 39 before taking out Guzma, finishing the evolution line with Crocodile at level 40. Lastly, I can head back to the Aether House to tear Gladian a new one, but if I go any further, I'll have to fight Nanu, the grand trial trainer of this area, so of course I headed back to grinding. The best area post trainers is Route 16, seeing as it's very close to a Pokemon Center, and the beast EXP yields of Gumshoes and Pelipper are fantastic, though Slowpoke is a bit garbage in comparison, but it only shows up 20% of the time, so it's not that much of a hindrance. There weren't that many rare candies obtained this section, but I got enough of a push for the pseudos to evolve at the end, getting Duosion into Reuniclus at level 41, Trapinch into Vibrava at level 44 and into Flygon one level later, and Gabite into Garchomp at level 48. Perfect! Now that everything's handled, I can go fight Nanu with a grand total of 287 Pokemon and a time of 171 hours and 54 minutes. He gets his bum handed to him, giving me permission to move on to Pawnee Island is what I would say if I didn't have to deal with the Aether Paradise plotline. There's nothing here to capture, nothing to grind, so it's completely unimportant to me in this situation, though holy moly there's a lot of trainers here. Luckily a lot of them are avoidable, but I really would have appreciated it if I could have at least gotten a Pokemon or two to grind while bashing my face into these various trainers. But hey, at least I've got something that's super high level to take care of everything. Once I destroyed Lusamine's honestly dope and diverse team, I'm given the Moon Flute and the Master Ball, finally letting me move on to the final island of the game. Though before I left, I should note that I did get three rare candies from Pickup while sitting around here, which all will come in very handy very shortly. It sort of helps that all four of my Meowths are over level 51, which now have an 8% chance of getting a rare candy after the 10% trigger of Pickup instead of the previous 3%. Here in the Seafolk Village now, there's two new Pokemon I can grab, the first of which being a gift Aerodactyl inside of a ship shaped like a Huntail. Thank you for your gift of extinct Pokemon? I swear, at this point these things should be just roaming the skies with how many fossils and DNA they seem to be recovering. Lastly, in the ship shaped like a Steelix, I can fish for Whalmer, Waylord from an SOS encounter, and Delmize in a bubbling spot. Nothing else is holding me here, so I'm able to head into the Pawnee Wilds, and boy there's a boatload of Pokemon here, including Granbull, Gastrodon, and Execute from the grass, with the latter of them immediately evolving into this monster of an Executor with a Leaf Stone. This thing never gets old. Look at that neck! There's a few more encounters here, such as the 5% Lapras from surfing, the 10% Relicanth from fishing in a bubbling spot, and last but not least, Samurott on Fridays through Island Scan. Crazy, huh? 
Well, since I still don't have to anything to evolve, I figured I'd go back to Paniola Ranch to breed Granbull, Gastrodon, and Samurott in order to hatch Snubble, Shellos, and Oshawa, respectively. Perfect, now I have something to grind. And immediately evolve into Diwat at level 17 because the trainers are so high leveled now that it doesn't even matter. Thankfully, in the Ancient Pawnee Path, there's another one of the Unova starters in Embor on Saturdays from Island Scan. So I can head my bum straight back to Paniola Ranch, breed for Tepig, and use a trainer around here to evolve it into Pig Knight at level 17. Pawnee Breaker Coast has a single encounter in Sharpedo from fishing in a bubbling spot, but I'm not going back to breed that just yet since I don't really need to evolve it. Instead, I just moved back into Seafolk Village, taking a ship to the Executor Island. This is the home of the last Unova starter in Superior on Thursdays from Island Scan. Alright, after grabbing the Sun Flute, I took one more trip back to Paniola Ranch for breeding, hatching myself both Carvana and Snivy, and taking the latter into the Ancient Pawnee Path to evolve into Servine at level 17. Now I can walk straight into Vast Pawnee Canyon, and since I deposited two of my Meowths while breeding, I brought in my Chargebug, Magneton, and Nosepass, giving one rare candy apiece to them to evolve them into Vicavolt, Magnezone, and Probopass while here, since this is the only area these Pokémon evolve in in the game. Finishing the section with a total of 313 Pokemon and a time of 174 hours and 41 minutes. No grinding feels pretty good, and about time we finally got to this point in the challenge where I don't have to worry about it. Hapu falls flat on her face, letting me continue onto the shortest section of the game. So, despite this section being the shortest, that doesn't mean that I don't have grinding to do. Further into the Fast Pawnee Canyon are two new encounters, those being Jangmo O from the grass, evolving into Hakamo O in one level straight away, and into Komo O in one more level, leaving just Dratini from a bubbling spot. Dratini can actually be caught within a wide spectrum of levels, from 10 all the way to 44, so I SOS'd it for the highest level that I could get, thankfully in the mid 40s. Now the question is where to grind up Dratini. Well, before that, I made sure to SOS chain Jengmo O until a Hakamo O showed up. Why, you may ask? Well, this Pokemon has a 50% chance of holding the Razor Claw, an item that we'll need for an evolution later on, and I don't feel like dealing with it later. Once obtained, though, it was a hop and a skip to grind Dratini, thanks to all of the trainers I had managed to skip on this island, as well as the rare candies I had yet to grab across the region, evolving it shortly into Dragonair and into Dragonite at level 55. And that's it for this section. Yeah, not bad, right? 313 Pokemon and a time of 177 hours and 4 minutes. I'll call that a job well done. Komo-O's trial is actually the last one in the game too, so I murdered his family, stole the Dragonium Z in the process, finishing the area off. What? Too much? Just beyond the canyon here is the altar of the Suni. I'm sure it's supposed to be pronounced Sun, but they spell it weirdly and fancily, I don't like it. Anyway, it's not that big of a deal as it's time to capture the box legendary. Well, after pummeling a Nihilist, of course. Solgaleo's not too terribly hard to capture since it has a catch rate of 45, the same capture rate as Politoed. And thanks to a nice little calculator from the Cave of Dragonflies, linked to their capture calculator in the description, since I have 245 Pokemon in the Pokedex, minus all the Island Scan Pokemon, I have a 41.8% chance of capturing Solgaleo in a Quick Ball. So, of course, I catch it first try. Why would I ever waste time weakening this thing? One more area to go, and it's Mount Lanakila. Of course, before heading up here, I battled Gladian, slaughtering his team, then making sure to grab Crabrawler and my last Eevee out of the PC, since these both evolve next to the Ice Rock into Grabominable and Glaceon respectively. And since they're so low level, a single wild encounter is able to push them both up a level. With that, there's only one Pokemon to capture here in Sun version, two in Moon version since you have to grab Drampa, but for me, that encounter is Sneasel. I'll evolve that shortly, but first I'm able to head into the Pokemon Center near the peak, bringing out my Piloswine and retweeting it Ancient Power thanks to the new move reminder. And thankfully, Heart Scales are pickup items in this game, so we're pretty much good to go. Since it's already nighttime, I slap that Razor Claw and Sneasel, keeping it in my party alongside Piloswine during the fight against Tau, and evolving them into Weavile and Mamoswine respectively in a single level, ending the section with a total of 320 Pokemon and a time of 177 hours and 56 minutes. Alright, time to assemble a team of monsters for the league. 
Kukui's ace is level 58, so I figured that Hydragon, Solgaleo, and Garchomp would be my best bets. And sure enough, Garchomp especially was able to win me the league. But we're not finished with the challenge yet, since we still have a few dozen Pokemon to go. Once we're into the post-game, we're given a celebration in Icky Town, where Lily brings us to the Ruins of Conflict. This is the home of Tapu Koko, and sure enough, these are the guys I'm going after first. Each island has their respective Tapu, and unfortunately for me, they're not as easily catchable as Solgaleo, seeing as they all have the standard legendary catch rate of 3. Thankfully, Coco doesn't have any moves that inflict recoil, so I'm able to damage it with False Swipe and chuck a boatload of Vulture Balls at it, capturing it within around 10. This lets me finish the festival, see Lily off to Kanto, and move on to Tapu Lele in Akala Island. This isn't as easily handled seeing as Tapu Lele has a super effective move in Moonblast, but after whittling it down again with False Swipe and throwing a bunch of Ultra Balls, I am finally able to get Lele in about 25 of them. Third up is Tapu Bulu, and thankfully it doesn't have any super effective attacks on my main Garchomp, which doesn't inhibit much, allowing me to grab it in 7 Ultra Balls. Last up on the list is Tapu Fini, who just has a bunch of water-type attacks, but of course it has Aqua Ring, so I basically have to alternate between False Swipe and throwing a ball. This was also the only of the Tapus that made me reset, so I had to rethink my strategy a little bit. Of course I could just put the thing to sleep, but none of my current Pokémon have any moves for that, and I'm too lazy to go back and get one. So I just taught Garchomp Sandstorm effectively negating the increase in HP from Aqua Ring and making it easy to catch Feeny in about a half dozen Ultra Balls on the second attempt. Thankfully, this stuff's done, and I can move on to the next group of monsters, the Ultra Beast. The UBs are part of a large quest involving Looker, who we've seen multiple times in games before, and Annabelle, the frontier brain from Pokemon Emerald. I'm not concerned about her story in this video, but believe me, when I get around to reviewing the Pokemon games and get to Sun and Moon, you can bet your ass that this is something I'm going to give a bit of time dissecting, since I think it's really neat. Anyways, with their help, I'm able to capture Nihilego in Wella Volcano Park, Buzzwall in the Mele Mele Meadows, or Pheromosa in the Verdant Cavern if you're playing Moon version, Zerkatry in the Lush Jungle, Kartana in the Mali Garden, or Celesteela in the Hyena Desert in Moon version, finishing off the quest with the final UB, a level 70 Guzzlord, who just so happens to have the same typing as Hydreigon, my favorite Pokemon. Coincidence? Absolutely, just getting the damn ball. And thanks for finishing the quest, I'm given... One million dollars. Dang, I didn't think I was going to be able to make that reference in a Pokemon video. Anyway, while we're here in the Aether Paradise picking up our pay, I can also head to the second floor, talk to Gladian, and grab myself a Type Null. Fortunately, I don't need these pickup meowths anymore, so stuffing it into the party isn't much of a task, since it does indeed require a high friendship. Anyway, the final UB isn't technically a UB, and that's Necrozma. He's down in the furthest hollow of Ten Carat Hill, and since there's no roamers in this game, Necrozma is the perfect Pokemon to throw a Master Ball at. Last legendary on the list is back at the altar of the Sunni, where I can go through the rift to change the time, but going through it with Solgaleo lets me head back into the Ula Ula Meadow, where that happens to be an eastern exit towards a new area, where I can finally access the altar of the Muni. Again, we don't need fancy spellings, but here I'm able to get myself a Cosmog. Sure, I can't evolve this thing fully to get the other box legendary, but we'll keep it in the party for now. Hmm, what's next on the list? Oh, right, the Seizure Guy. The Aether Foundation building on Route 15 now houses a scientist with a Porygon, which I can immediately box due to its evolutions being trade only. Fantastic. There's a few more areas that actually have new Pokemon to encounter, but before that, why not scan this fancy QR code and get myself a Magearna? I mean, we've been doing Island Scan this whole time, why not get this thing too? Alright, enough scurbing around, there's only a few more Pokemon to grab, and the majority of them, funnily enough, have to do with Island Scan. Heading back onto Pawnee Island, I can head into the Pawnee Grave, which is north of the ancient Pawnee Path. Alright, who decided late into development that naming everything Pawnee was something that was the right decision? Oh well, here at least I can grab a shiny Grand Bull hitting a Trifecta in this run, which I actually captured to satisfy some of you that probably bashed your monitors in when I locked out the last two. I can also capture Riolu as well as Electros on Sundays from Island Scan. 
Riolu's gonna take another spot in the party as another friendship evolution, coming along for the ride into the Pawnee Plains where I can grab Imolga from a shaking tree, Scyther from a shaking bush, and Conkelder from Island Scan on Mondays. Another trade evolution, need I suppose? Last area to handle is the Pawnee Gauntlet, which houses Togekiss on Tuesdays through Island Scan, and in the Pawnee Meadow is Lee Vanny on Wednesdays through Island Scan, finishing up our last encounters of the game. So, after breeding for Tynamo, Timber, Togepi, and Sidlotl, what should I do to finish up these last few evolutions? Well, first of all, we've got a bunch of friendship evolutions, so why not head back up to Mount Hokulani, which sells all of the vitamins? Slapping the Soothe Bell onto Riolu, Togepi, and Type Null and feeding them a bunch of vitamins until they can't take anymore both wipes out my $1 million plus bank account, but also gives me plenty enough friendship to where only a few battles is enough to evolve the majority of what's left, those being Togepi into Togetic, Sawaddle into Swadloon at level 20, Riolu into Lucario during the day, Type Null into Silvali, and Timber into Girder at level 25. Of course, this leaves just Tynamo and Cosmog. They evolve close to or above level 40, so it took a good few trainers to get them the EXP required. Luckily, there was a lot of them that I haven't fought yet, so that allowed me to evolve Tynamo into Electric at level 39, and Cosmog into Cosmoem at level 43. Hereby finishing this challenge with a grand total of 362 Pokemon, and a time of 183 hours and 21 minutes. Finally, I finished an Oak Challenge in Gen 7! Well, that's actually in Alola, since technically Let's Go is in Gen 7, but I'm not gonna ruin the relief that's finally going through me as I finish this video. It felt good to finally do this in-depth playthrough of Sun and Moon as well, since I truly haven't played these since they've released in 2016, since I've always had the belief that Ultra Sun and Moon basically replaced them in every way. But there are some darn good factors in the originals that put it in front of USUM story-wise, absolutely beating out the sequel games, though those are more difficult for the battles, but I digress. I'll go over this when I decide to review these games. Anyway, with all of this being said, the next time I go after the Professor Oaks challenge, I'll probably be finishing up Gen 2 with Gold and Silver before the Gen 4 remakes come out, seeing as I'm already halfway done with that challenge anyway, and believe me, we are going to be full throttle with content with the release of those and Pokemon Legends Arceus in January. It'll be a busy time, but it'll be a pretty darn fun time nonetheless. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, click the bell, tell a friend, and don't spend more than a minute doing that, since if you are, you're taking too long. I want to give a huge shout out to my $10 and above patrons, Justin Dimenstein, Aaron Reinsmith, Aiden Brannon, Alexander Abde, Andy, Casper Kirkpatrick, Heimflo, Jacob Johnson, Kyle Campbell, Phoenix Fire, and Zeno. Thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to support as well, you can head over to my Patreon page, link in the description, where you can get access to stuff like videos early, an exclusive role on my Discord server, link also in the description, challenge requests, and much more. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to watch this, and I'll see you guys next time with another challenge. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.